Good evening, everybody. So tonight's speaker is a long-standing member who joined the society back in 1982 at the grand old age of 18. Became interested in astronomy at an age which he cannot remember after his grandfather showed him the great bear and the pole star from their backyard in Mexpra. He learned his first constellations from a map in the back of a 1930s encyclopedia, which he still has today. During the 1960s, he followed the Apollo missions on the news while the Mercury and Gemini missions were a little too early in his life. During 1970s, he became interested in the planets with the launch of Viking and Voyager. Then, uh, after moving to Swinton, Phil's first real interest in astronomy took hold in the 80s after buying his first 60 millimeter Tasco, which led him to joining the society. From that point on, he's been a continuous member devoted to its success, continuity and outreach to the public. He built the society's first two meter observatory at, at college in 1983, which was designed to be portable. So any member of the society could use it and was the blueprint for the design of the five meter observatory, which is now at our own site in Huber. In Huber. Over this period, he also became interested in radio astronomy, following the Mir space station, the International Space Station, Soyuz, and the Space Shuttle. More recently, he's built his own, and how do we pronounce this, Philip? Y yagi, Yagi Aerial. Yagi, doesn't look very Yagi to me. Oh. But <laughs> yagi Aerial to detect meters entering the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, I could go on, he says, which of course he has done it, you know. Anyway, tonight's talk is a topic close to his heart, Greek astronomy. He looks at the discovery of the oldest known computer, how it was put together and what it meant to the early Greeks. This also gives an insight into the early Greeks' understanding of the cosmos. So please welcome Mr. Philip Muffet. Well, thanks, Steve. Pleasure. Okay, so I've, I've been interested in, in astronomy, as you can see, for a long time, and uh, I've been interested in constellations and Greeks and Egyptians and the birth of astronomy and how the constellations come together uh, and how they work. Uh, the sun and moon's been a bit of a, not been a high priority to me over the years, but it is obviously one of those objects that you can see uh, all the time uh, and, and enjoy. Anyway, so anyway, so talking about the Antikythera, uh, this is a picture I took myself last year uh, on a cruise and uh, it's a place I've always wanted to see and it just happened to dra drop on uh, last year. Uh, we went to Corfu, sailed through the Aegean Sea uh, to Rhodes, uh, which is a favourite place of mine, uh, and then back to uh, Corfu again. On the way to Rhodes, we actually passed Corfu. I've got a GPS and I had it on in the ship so I knew where we were. And we passed this island uh, on the way to, to Rhodes and we, uh, at the night time and we passed it in the daytime on the way on the way back. And I just managed to catch a picture of the island in the distance. I've not seen one on the internet before and I actually caught my own photo. So I'm quite pleased with that. Yeah, so that's the island of Antikythera. Uh, which is like the gateway into the Aegean Sea uh, from the Mediterranean. You can just see in the distance. And I just managed to capture it. Uh, that was about as close as I got with an eye setting sunset. So anyway, so yes. So I started my cruise over in Corfu. We sailed down the side of Greece. Can you see my mouse on the, on the screen? Can. Right. And then we rescued some illegal migrants around here. We had to rescue them because it's maritime international law. If you find people in distress and the boat was sinking with about 150 people on board, you've got to rescue them. And then we did a, a slight detour into this massive bay and dropped them off uh, in this bay just here. And there's some fantastic massive mountains in the background over here. And then we ended up, as nightfall came along, we'd sail around the bottom of Antarctica. Uh, so I didn't see the island of Antikythera, which is just there. 
and then we ended up going to Santorini and then across to uh, Coz, uh, went to Rhodes, round to Lindos, and then we came back via Crete and then passing Antikythera, which is this little island here again, and then we came back to uh, Zante and, and Co uh, sorry, Kefalonia and then back to Corfu. So that was my little trip. Took a few photos on the way and took in some of the uh, Greek culture and visited some of the local temples and uh, buildings in the area. So going back thousands of years, BC, well, about a thousand years BC up to up to Roman period, uh, I've downloaded the map here and you can see how important Greece was at that period. We've got major settlements in Greece and around the Mediterranean and the Greeks were really good with ships and they did a huge amount of trade. Uh, they had to be good at navigation to find their way around. They did a lot of trade with Egypt and they also did quite a lot of trade with the Romans and right across as far as Spain. So we can see where the, where the areas are, are redder. There's a huge amount of Greek influence. And the other thing is, if you ever read uh, Jason and the Archonauts, if you are familiar with it, a lot of these trading areas are where, oh, it's gone, skipped a slide. A lot of these areas is where the Argonauts ha actually visited. And the Golden Fleece was somewhere in the mountains at the, at the end of the Black Sea. And I think the Clashing Mountains, or the Clashing, yeah, the Clashing Mountains were somewhere uh, in the Bos is it the Bosporus just there? I can't remember now. Uh, anyway, so so the, the Greeks uh, told told the story of, uh, of Jason the Argonauts as a way of, like a road map, it's like a, a, a mental road map and places where you could visit and go and what to watch out for. Now then, the, uh, the, the, the story about the Cathera, how it was discovered, hold on to me next, hold on to me, uh, how it was discovered, uh, a guy or a captain from Simi, which is near Rhodes, uh, sorry, uh, Cos, somewhere between Rhodes and Cos. It's a small volcanic island that's still active. Uh, when I was on it, it had a minor earthquake when I visited it years and years ago, uh, which, were, which were really, really interesting. There's sulfur plumes up on the top of the mountain as well. Uh, they, they had some sponge divers, and the aim was to go across to, to North Africa. Anyway, across traveling across to North Africa, they had a storm. So they pulled into the back of the island at Antikythera, which is just out here with a mouse, uh, and they sheltered from the storm. After the storm had passed, they uh, said, well, rather than, we've lost a couple of days, why, rather than go across the bed, why don't we see if there's something here? So they had a dive. While they had a dive, one of the, one of the guys spotted something at the, in the bottom of the sea, a hand pointing out of the out of the rocks at the bottom of the sea, and they went down to investigate. I think it was about forty-five meters deep, and they found uh, the wreck of a, the wreck of a ship. Now, the type of ships that the Greeks were using, there were a couple of different types. One's cargo, which is this example at the bottom, which is a simple plank planking system uh, with motors and double tenons. Uh, and bent, of course, and there were, there were obviously extremely good building ships that have been doing it for thousands of years. We also have uh, Roman ships uh, and Greek warships built slightly different in the fact that they've got like a promon promontory bow which they used to use for ramming uh, as, as, as warships, whereas the merchant ships and trading ships tended to have more of a, a rounded bow. So there were different types of ships and they were, came in lots of different sizes. How 100 metres long wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have been out of the ordinary. So they were really quite good at shipping. Sails as well. Uh, and of course you had oars to get yourself uh, out of trouble, I suppose. Right, so these are the guys. It's Captain, Captain Dimitrios, I believe his name is. And he was the guy that actually found uh, the, the wreck. Uh, in in the bay that they've been that they've been uh, stopping in, in in the shelter, and this is an example of some of the finds that they got out. One of the be some of the best art, uh, objects that the Greeks were good at were producing bronzes. Now I don't know who this bronze is supposed to be that's on the on the right hand side, but it's as good a quality as anything uh, you'd find in 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 Europe. 
uh, or in the Renaissance period, whether it's in, in uh, stone, uh, granite or, or, or metal, uh, really high quality. And he's holding, he's putting his hand out, was always picking a fruit, I think. And there's the usual urns for carrying things like your uh, ol uh, olives in and your wine and your grain. And then there's also high quality glasses. This is a piece of glass with different colours streaking through it. Uh, and then we've also got a bronze face. Again, I don't know who it is, but you sometimes see statues with hollows in the eyes. And what they used to do is they used to like put stones or gems in the eyes or glass beads. So you'd like get the, the, uh, the cornea of the eye. Uh, but a lot of these go missing, so you don't see them. And they also found some lumps of bronze as well, which they didn't realise what they were at the time. And it took quite a time for them to realise what these pieces of bronze were. I think they pulled out about 40, 40, 40 50 pieces of, of bronze of varying sizes. Uh, okay. Right. This is the, the site revisited. Uh, I think it was in the in the noughties or, or, the, or the early teens. Uh, they, th they decided them, there must be some more items down there and they went to went, went to, to, to see if they could find any. And I think they also discovered another ship on the sec on the visit that they did in, in the uh, in the early teens. Now whether there was two ships uh, harboured in the storm that sank at the same time. Uh, or whether or not another ship had been in the same place and then sunk until a later date, I don't know. But they are like Greek Roman period, uh, Greek, Greek Roman period antiquities that they discovered. Now they did find some coins, and the coins are usually the uh, archaeologist's dream because it's a really, really good way of dating actual finds and some of the coins they found were, were about 50, 50 years BC. So that's when they think approximately this ship actually sank around, around 50 years BC. So that kind of gives a date on, on everything that's in, inside the ship. And they think that the ship was Roman. I've heard it was a Greek ship taking taxes from Greece to Rome. But later articles I've read have suggested the woodwork in the ship that they found, because some of it survived, is more Roman than Greek. So I really don't know which, which, whether it is Roman or Greek. So if they were Romans, they might have been collecting taxes or pillaging people, I don't know. And they were taking obviously expensive artifacts back to Rome. And this was in the period, I think, around Julius Caesar time, if I remember correctly. And then up here on the top right hand side, we find an artifact which is which is bronze, which is kind of an encrusted gear. Now nobody realised at first what this was, and it took a year or two before one of the uh, scientists at the Athens Museum in Greece realised there was some actual what appeared to be gears inside this encrusted bronze. After some debate with his colleagues, his colleagues decided that gears were too advanced for the Greek period and this had actually been deposited on the wreck at some later date. Uh, this has kind of been proven wrong, wrong since then. So uh, the first x-rays, the, these were a kind of, uh, I can put it, th th this was the best way they could get to see the actual mechanism or what things were because to chip away at this piece of bronze would destroy what was actually uh, inside the uh, crusty part of the bronze. I don't know how how badly C corrodes bronze or how long it takes or whether the part of it is due to like natural erosion being in the bottom of the sea. I don't know. But anyway, rather than clean it up and take scale off it, they've, they've obviously x-rayed this. This is an early x-ray, I think from the 1950s, what might be about 1957. And you can clearly see there is several layers to this piece of uh, metalwork. You can see like a main disc with a cross in it, and then you can see some gearing in it, and you can quite distinctively see the gearing. And then lower down to the left, the main picture, you can see that there's some, there's some curved areas where there's like pieces missing. 
uh, and there's also some of them kind of inside. And then someone has drawn this uh, to the bottom left pictorially. So, of course, looking at that, it's really difficult to work out what on earth this is. And it took them a long time to, uh, to work this out. So later, I think this is about 2010-ish, they, uh, they, some, somebody built a new 3D uh, X-ray machine. Now, one of the guys involved with the machine said, we, uh, we ought to re-X-ray the, the Cathera, Antikythera. So the Greeks wouldn't let this mechanism out of Greece because they didn't want to lose it. Uh, in the sea, in an aeroplane crash, or nick, get nicked, or whatever, or just not have it returned, like the Elgin marbles to <laughs> to to uh, to to, uh, to uh, what they call it to Greece. So, so they said you're going to have to come to us. So the specially built uh, uh, 3D X-ray machine, which weighed about eight tons. And they shipped it over to the to, to Greece, Athens, and then they had to get it inside the building. And the guy said that, that did it, it. They had to shoehorn this 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 X-ray machine into the building. It was a really tight squeeze, apparently. But anyway, they got it inside. Once they got it inside the museum, they X-rayed this. So these X-rays can like zoom in and zoom out, so they can actually go through different layers of the bronze. And they can also spin it round. Uh, I don't know if any are into archaeology. Uh, they've done this with uh, Tutankhamun, where they can like take slices through the body, and they can also turn it over, spin it round, and look at it from different angles. This is all the same kind of technology. So as you can see, when you're looking at these, they're not the, the these were the best pictures I could find on the internet. You can see the gearing in more finer detail. Uh, so people have, have been looking at this and trying to work out exactly what function it was. And then they also found some a slot in one of the gears, which is a, a key feature to part of the mechanism. And you can see how these are meshing in, these gears are meshing in together as well. So it got more interesting. So several group of scientists, uh, so you can see in the picture, it's crusty on the left and then we're cleaning it up to the right right hand side uh, got together uh, some have been working together and some some people have been working independently to try and work out how it, what this thing was and how it went fit together and how, and how, how it worked uh, okay so gears i think the metal that they used or just perhaps i'll just come back a little bit when we talk about roads uh, it's not like a, a a name that trips off your tongue other than for holiday destinations or Back in the day, uh, 500 BC, uh, Rhodes was quite an important place in the fact that they were extremely good at producing bronze. Uh, apart from doing doing uh, statues, uh, they obviously were producing this kind of equipment. Uh, and because it's never survived or been written down, we didn't know about it. So these guys were producing uh, bronze artifacts. I think these discs or the cogs, I think they're about one and a half millimeters thick. So uh, once you've like got your plate, you've then got to cut it out. Then you've got to like draw it and uh, file it down and then machine uh, your bronze. Now, uh, I'm not a, a metal worker, so I don't know how difficult this is, but I would say it's quite a quite a tricky job. And I wouldn't. It, you'd need to be a tradesman and a skilled technician to produce this kind of stuff. Uh, as a joiner, I'm okay with bits of wood. But when it comes to metal, I kind of come unstuck a bit. So you can see from the diagrams, there's ratios of gears. So you have an input gear, and that input gear you spin round, and it drives other gears. So this kind of in, instrument didn't appear overnight. So it's probably been going on for several hundred years to get to this kind of level of perfection. And astronomy-wise, they'd, they'd known about uh, the motions of the stars and, and the moon uh, for hundreds of years uh, since Babylonian times. But this gives you an idea of the complexity of what the, work, what, what the piece of machinery was. So then they had some writing on some of the faces and it was on the left. 
you can see it's quite dark and it's difficult to read. Well, there's a guy, uh, he did, he did just photometry, and he, he came up with this idea. If he made, if he took lots of different photographs of an object from different angles uh, with a flash, stuck them all together, you could actually make a 3D model of whatever you're photographing, uh, and the light from different angles uh, shows up the shows up the features of what you're photographing. So this guy made half a sphere, half a dome, and then they've got lots of lights at different angles, and they basically they like photographed one object from I don't know 50 angles, and then you put it all together in your computer, and then you get like a 3D model. So you can see on the left it's a normal photograph, on the right it's the uh, enhanced a photo and suddenly while, while you can see letters on the left on the right they just stand out so much crisper and it's due to the due, due to the angle of light so uh, parts of the equipment i've got i've, I've got writing in that is obviously tricky to, to read and amazed it's actually survived over two thousand years in a second that we can still actually read anything and people started to uh, decipher uh, what these what these writings were now then, the backside, earlier on I showed you a photograph where you could see some like uh, grooves in metal. Well, these, this is what the grooves are. What they've worked out is there's a spiral form on the bike, and there's not just one, there's actually two spirals, uh, concentric circles, uh, which I've, I've drawn one myself. I've never done one of these before, uh, so I watched a few videos and then drew it out backwards because I wanted to make one of these and it's not easy. And then on the right hand side we can see, see what one of these things are and what it appears to be is, is, a, is, a, is, a, lunar, is a lunar solar cycle or an eclipse cycle uh, and I don't know what the writing is on the squares but as you go around each square on the curve is a, is a full moon uh, and the, where the writing is I think that's where the lunar eclipses, whether full or partial. So obviously to the Greeks, uh, the, the lunar cycle is extremely important. So whether they named each eclipse or a different name, I don't know. But anyway. So to decipher some of this, we need to know a bit about, a bit, a bit about the sun and moon. So uh, I don't know how much some of our newer members know about the motions of the sun across the sky, but is a brief introduction. So when we look at the sky, we split the sky uh, up north and southern hemisphere with the equator that goes around the middle, and then we have the North Pole and the South Pole. And then pre-Greek time, but whether it's Babylonian, Egyptian or Greek time, the sphere was cut up into segments so that we've got 24 hours around, uh, around the globe, which is 360 degrees. Now, if we peel that off and lay it flat, we've, we've got north and south, and then we've got the equator. Now, because the sun, or the earth, is inclined to the sun, we have what's called equal day and night, which is the equinox. And then we have a point in December where the pole, in the northern hemisphere, is pointing away from the sun. So we've got the, the winter solstice when the sun's at its lowest part in the sky and then the summer solstice when it's at the highest point in the sky in our hemisphere. So if we draw this out, what we get is we get the sun travelling across. So imagine the equator is 365 days and, and 360 degrees. So as the sun travels, as the earth spins round the sun, the sun tracks across the sky and it's like a sine curve, so it comes up. The equinox, that is called the vernal equinox, where the, where the sun transits the uh, equator on its northern passage, which is, which is that point there, oh, sorry, which is this point here. So the sun continues to rise in the sky until it gets to the summer uh, equinox, uh, sorry, solstice, and then it starts to travel back down into the southern horizon over the autumnal, equinox and then down to the southern solstice which is our which is our winter so that's relatively uh, reasonable to understand but then not only have we got the sun that, go, that goes round 
when I say goes around the earth, what I mean is apparently it goes around the earth. Because for this model to work, that's what happens. You've also got the moon that goes around the earth as well. And this isn't in the same plane as the sun because it's inclined at about five degrees to the ecliptic. So the sun goes, so the earth moon goes lower than the ecliptic, it goes on the ecliptic and it also goes higher than the ecliptic. So it, so it wobbles up and down and that's what this diagram on the left is trying to depict. So if we go to the next one, so here we have the solid line, Burn equinox, summer solstice, autumnal equinox, and then it's back down to the winter equinox. And then the moon, because it's inclined the, to, the, to the ecliptic or the sun as it goes around the earth, we get a five degree difference here. So when the moon's at its lowest, you can see it's below the sun's path. And then when it's at its highest, it's above sun's path across the sky so you can see how it varies up and down above and down the equator now this is important because the greeks are trying to measure out the length of the year and where they when the sun when the moon and the sun cross each other on the nodes this is a node that's the ascending node for the moon so the sun's traveling up here where the moon comes up here that crosses the ecliptic and then as it goes across, at some point it will descend through the ecliptic on the lunar descending mode. And that's what that little symbol is there. It's the same symbol, just upside down from the other. Uh, and that depicts Aries, the ram, which is the first point of Aries. Because when the Greeks were doing all this, it was in Aries. So that's why it's got the color first point of Aries. And then this symbol here is Libra. Uh, where it's where the sun's descending through through the equator. So I hope that's <laughs> I hope that explains okay. Now if we look on the left on this slide, we can see the Earth is tilted away from the sun here on the axis, and then we have got the equator which runs across there. That's the celestial and the Earth's equator, and then we've got the sun which is tilted. In the in the sky at 23 and a half degrees, but well, then there's also a tilt uh, of the moon, which is another five degrees. So when the sun's when the moon's at its highest, uh, it's it plus 28 and a half degrees above the equator, and then when it's below, it's minus 28.5 degrees. Uh, now then, when it's at its min minimum, uh, you subtract the five degrees. So it might, it's plus 18.5 and minus 18.5 above, above and below. Okay. Now then, how does that affect us? Well, if we come back to the real world, could be a stone circle uh, somewhere in England or France. So the summer solstice is when the sun's at its highest. The equinox is when it's equal day and equal night. So the moon rises, on the, sorry, the sun rises and the sun sets at equal times. The winter solstice is when the sun's lower and you can see the sun moves lower down on the horizon, further south. Okay. And then the summer, the sun's higher, obviously. And then if you follow the curve around sunsets, further, further north and further north. Now then, if you were to put the moon into this, when the moon's on the top above the ecliptic, that's the highest it gets. And you can see it moves around higher than the sun. Now, scientists have, have put this model uh, to certain stone circles around the, around the UK, uh, in Scotland and Stonehenge. And some of the major stones appear to line up with the major standstill of the moon of which it's called and the lower standstills uh, and the winter and summer summer solstice and, equi and the equinox so we can see this was important not to our stone age but it was also important to the greeks and this was a way of telling time and knowing when you were during the season especially with the equinoxes 
and the solstices. This was the key way of working out what time of year you were in. Because as I've said before, when you do astronomy and you follow the stars, when it when it's when it's autumn time, it might start drawing in. You need to make sure you've got your crops in, and if you you need to make sure you've got some meat in your larder, because when winter creeps in and you've not done all those things, you're going to end up starving during the winter. So it was critical to the early civilizations understanding about crops and animals and migrations uh, and where to be and what to do at specific times and then of course it became uh, also a religious item as well because sun and moon and the planets were also regarded as gods now when i say gods what i mean is they're earthly forces so we have mother earth we have the uh, sun god we have the uh, moon god uh, like Selena. So while we don't see them as gods as a in a term we use today, to the ancients the gods influenced what people did. So obviously the sun influences the seasons, it influences the weather, the moon influences the tides, and then of course the earth produces food and it also have earthquakes and, and that kind of phenomena. So the 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 elements, the natural elements around us were referred to as gods so it is what it was and it is important to, to early early civilizations to understand all that so i hope i hope that, that that's okay now then right encoded in some of this antikythera are the uh are the nodes are very very important because when the nodes uh Across the ecliptic near the equator, we get quite often we get uh, solar eclipses, whether they're full or partial. And then at night time, during full moons, we get partial and, and total lunar eclipses. And if we remember the previous diagrams, I showed where the where the nodes of the moon pass the sun and the ecliptic. In uh, if we look from a superior point of view, we can see what's happening here. So we've got the sun and moon at different angles, but when they, at some point over the years, they actually coincide and they cross each other near the celestial equator. And when that happens, uh, that's when we get pairs of eclipses. So we've got one here on the south south node, and we've also got one on the on the on the north node as it's ascending through. So. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that should be about it for that. So you can see how that works as the Earth's going around and the, and the Sun's going around over the Moon. So here's another way of describing it. So when you're going to get a, a so total lo lunar eclipse, the Earth's over to the left. So the Earth's ca ca casting a shadow into space. And the Moon's coming around, uh, crosses the ecliptic, and you get a lunar, lunar eclipse. Uh, now then, what what the Greeks were doing is they were they were making a note of where the moon was in the sky uh, and fixing it in the sky against a starry background because uh, it's very well the equipment they had it was easy for them to do during a, a total solar eclipse when the Earth is in, uh, Earth is uh, this moon that moons in front of the earth you can see how it casts a shadow and they the, the timed when this happened and in a, during a total solar eclipse you can obviously see stars in the sky so they could measure the distance uh, of the sun away from stars into the sky so they were plotting basically where the sun and moon was moving through the heavens okay and another thing that the Greeks understood was was perigee and apogee uh, because the moon uh, got larger and smaller. Now, at perigee when we're closer, the moon's large. I think we had a super moon a few years ago when it's a, when it's its perigee and then apogee when it's small. Uh, you can see there's a difference in size and, and it, it's apparent, it's quite apparent as well. You can see, you can see this phenomena, naked eye. And the other thing they noticed was the, the moon sped up and slowed down. Uh, how on earth they first measured that is 
beyond my comprehension. I still struggle to work out how the Egyptians and the Greeks timed the sky. They can split it up into 360 degrees and you can time the sun going across the, the horizon. But to have a 24-hour clock and have it accurate, I, 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 don't, I don't know how they did it. <laughs> there's, there's a talk there all on its own. You can work out when it's noon, but then there's like the equation of time and everything else. But yeah, quite quite remarkable. So what the, what we've got here is we've got two we've got two uh, cycles. We've got a meton what's called a metonic cycle. I think meton. Uh, I think it was about three fifty BC, uh, and the the, uh, the Saros cycle. Now the Saros cycle or was to predict eclipses. So these are all all uh, full. Uh, full full moon or new moons uh, and I think this predicts when you're going to get an eclipse so that's when the moon and the sun are crossing the ecliptic together and then the other one is the meton cycle uh, which is which is predicting wh which constellations and where the full moons occur for a I think it was for a 76 year period and in the mechanism, we can see here, this is the back side of the mechanism. And they've put the gears together to represent what was working. And it drives the handle on the side, which I'll show you later. So what a turn of the mechanism turns the gears. And it drives these, these arms. And these arms slide through a, a catchment uh, along a groove in the back of these metal uh, this, this metal plate uh, which is quite ingenious so they've turned a linear a linear gauge into a circular gauge so that it's non-stop uh, or over a 70 76 year period which is which is quite remarkable to be honest uh, and of course this is all made out of bronze and you can see the gearing how, how it all works together so it's, it's quite ingenious, to say the least. The front of the mechanism, again, we've got the handle on the side here. This drives the face. So we have we have the face, which is basically, it's it's like a, a planisphere. So we've got 360 degrees around the side. We've got like hours. And then we've also got the, the constellations, Gemini, Cancer, your Leo, all the way around. So that they basically had fingers if we look on the right you can see we have the earth is depicted in the center because all the measurements are taken from the earth the earth's at the center the next body out from the earth is the moon now i can see the moon here so as you turn the handle we each day the moon is moving around this disc and not only does it move around this disc it also is half black and half white so this also tells you what phase the moon's at. Not only does it tell you the phase, it also has the effect of apogee and perigee where the moon slows down and speeds up in its orbit as it actually travels around the earth, which is absolutely remarkable. Not only that, they believe that there were some, some gears have not been discovered. Let me put it that way. I think there was additional pointers in the mechanism for the planets so we have mercury venus mars jupiter and saturn so this this drives the planets through the constellations as well the constellations around the side and the months around the side as well i think the constellations were in egyptian uh, and the moon months were written in, in greek so basically uh, once this was calibrated to a date, uh, somebody drove it each day so you could know where the planets were in the, in the sky. So actually, this is a four, fourth dimension, four, four dimensional piece of equipment because this also is a time machine and it can take you into the future and it can take you into the past. So if you want to know where the planets were 100 years ago, you could te technically wind this back uh, a few thousand days to get back to the date, or you could wind it up into the future and predict where the planets were going to be. Now, 
as I said earlier, the, the planets and the sun and moon are all gods and uh, they put a lot of faith <laughs> in the gods and what was going to happen. Uh, so basically you had the power of, of I can put it, uh, of where, what, what the gods were doing into the future, which was, which was quite, quite an amazing thing. And you can see on this left here, you can see not only were they producing gears, this has also got tubes that are connected to the gears. Now, I, I don't know how you make a bronze tube. So these light straws, and they, the, there's got to be what, what, one, two, three, four, there's got to be six, there's got to be at least six of these that all slide inside of each other that are connected to gears inside. And then it's all going to work together. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. So I hope you're, you're following this. Now then, let me have a drink. This isn't an easy lecture. So the Greeks were really set themselves a task on trying to work out how long a year was. And they got they got it reasonably accurate. To be fair to them, meet on. I've had to I've had to type these. I've typed these in today. If there's any spelling mistakes, you'll have to forgive me because I haven't had a chance to second check all this. This has been a really really stressful talk for me. So meet on around 4:30 BC. I should have put BC on here. That they they used a 235 month calendar, uh, which worked out over 15 at uh, 19 year period. Now why 19 years? If you look at a synodic month, uh, a synodic month is if you look at the moon, the moon goes round the Earth and back to the same point in in the sky. Uh, uh, once in a month so because a month is 29 and a half days or thereabout it never works exactly because the uh, because there's 30 days in a month 31 or 29 so the moon never tallies up exactly with the with the earth's motion so there's always a little bit out well they worked out over 19 years which is 235 months the moon gets back almost to the same point in the sky i think there's about one and a half hours of arc difference in 19 years okay so working on 19 years that's 6940 days which equals a year length if you divide it back of 365.25 days now we use a year which is basically 365 and a quarter which is 0.25 now then calipus who came along later uh, talking 330 bc he used the 223 month uh, 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 cycle over which works out in an 18 year period times that by four to get a 76 year cycle now if you take a 76 year cycle that's 27,759 days now that works out at 365 and a quarter days in a year now then Aristarchus and Aristosthenes worked on the same kinds of basis as but when we got to Hipparchus, Hipparchus was a really really good astronomer and he had a really really good piece of equipment and he realized taking observations of a lunar uh, eclipse and taking measurements uh, on the descending road with Spica he worked out that the actual ecliptic was moving across the sky by I think it was one degree every hundred years and I think it's about uh, uh, I think it moves one degree every 76 years I think it actually moves but it was pretty close with the equipment he's using now these astronomers by the time we were in the Parkinson's years they're taking measurements that to, uh, to 40 seconds of arc now what I mean by that is if you were to look at a star in the sky and time 40 seconds see how far the stars moved that is the accuracy at which these astronomers are working so it's pretty it's pretty advanced ptolemy uh of uh uh f f f was in alexandria 
in Egypt. He collated and he worked in the library uh, in Alexandria. He collected a lot, a lot of papers. To, oh, well, I've skipped. Hang on a sec. Sorry. He collected, collected a lot of papers and wrote the Almagest, which I've got a copy, which is a really bit of a tin read. Anyway, uh, Ptolemy and Hipparchus, uh realised that the previous astronomers, such as Callippus and Meton, hadn't got it quite right. And Tol Ptolemy and Hipparchus were that precise. They actually worked out it was slightly less than a quarter of a day, 365 and a quarter. And they suspected it was about 365.24. Now, I think today's measure, measuring to uh, four decimal places. I think it's 365.2425 days. So, but the guess it was about 0.24 because Ptolemy admits that him and Hipparchus couldn't measure it any more accurate over the, all the records that had used through history. But they suspected it was it was in that kind of figure. So there were between them that that almost nailed it. They just couldn't work out exactly what the length of the year was, because some of the some of the equinoxes flicked backwards and forwards slightly, and they couldn't work out quite why that was happening. But they did guess that the the year was a little bit shorter than what they'd previously thought. So so these these Greek Greeks were using, like I said, the the moon and the sun to work out together the length of the year. Uh, okay. And they call these calip calipic years. So we like using the G G Julian calendar now. Before that, they were using the calipic one. And some people have gone back in time and found the Julian dates for some of these events that have happened in the past. I've tried. I've looked at one or two myself. And if you look, if you put the dates into Stellarium, you can actually wind Stellarium back BC and see the eclipses uh, that they were seeing, so which I thought were quite interesting. If you like that kind of thing. Now then, another interesting point about, about Ptolemy. Before, before Ptolemy, uh, and the, the Egyptians had, this is a ceiling of, of the Dendra Temple in Egypt. You can see that the sky is representative of animals and figures and people. And they basically, the, 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 the stars are hieroglyphs. And the Egyptians believed uh, words came from, from God. And God was in the sky. And the, the, the pictures in the sky were the word of God. So that the, the pictorialized the sky, right? When Ptolemy came along and you read his Almagest, he plotted all them, I think he plotted over a thousand stars, and he plotted the constellations, the major bright stars, probably I think down to three or fourth mag third or fourth magnitude. Instead of doing a pictorial drawing, he decided it was much simpler to connect the stars together by lines. So it gave an outline of the constellation, but not a picture of the constellations. And that's what the, the middle pictures de depicting. So he's basically simplifying. Now if you read his work, what he did was he went through the constellations and he basically identified a star, the armpit or the knee or the eye, named what part of the body the star was in, uh, what part of the body the star was represented, so you knew which star it was, uh, and then he connected them, them, them together. So uh, you could basically read his work and convert it back into a picture. If you see where I'm coming from, and then later uh, we we get a we can now get a combination. And you can do this on Stellarium. You can click on a constellation and put the lines in, which is the uh, Ptolemy version, or you can go and put the pictures in over the top, so you can see bulls and Virgo and Corona Borealis, uh, Berenice, and all those kinds of things. So. That's where the line pictures come from before the Greeks. It, they, were, they, they were actually more pictorial. So I thought that was a little, I thought that were interesting. So now then, so on astrolabe, how did they measure the accuracy of the stars and the planets? 
well well th this is a this is a, a solar a lunar astrolabe there's a couple of different types of astrolabe uh normally it's a flat disc with a with a swiveling guide so you can pinpoint the angle of a star this this was a little bit more technical in fact it was three dimensional not one dimensional and in his book he describes how to actually make one of these things now now this astrolabe in the middle is made out of bronze and what they did is and i've no idea how they did this they had a lathe and they turned bronze discs from solid solid metal into these pieces of equipment and they also used compasses you can see on this table he's got a pair of compasses uh, on a sheet of paper or with a little bit of papyrus at the time and what they do is uh, on this ring that's on the i'd say this is probably on the ecliptic they have two sides this isn't just one ring there's actually two rings and what they can do is they can set one ring up which goes through the center of the piece of equipment to the side of star now if you plot the sun on a flat on the back on a, on a on a sheet of paper on the ecliptic on the equator and you know where the sun is in the sky like in an eclipse you can pinpoint a star in the daytime because it's an eclipse uh, and plot it on your map once you know where one star is it might be Sirius it might be Regulus it might be Arcturus you can basically during the night time use that star as a reference to plot other stars and gradually work your way around the sky now the uh, Greeks and Egyptians picked bright stars near the ecliptic as main stars, like Regulus and Spica. We've got Antares, they're all very close. They would have been the main stars that are plotted originally and then worked away from them during the night. So you can pick one star using this astrolabe and then you can measure it with your other guide to the next star. Horizontally, but you can also do it vertically because there's vertical graduations on these as well so you can measure your sky horizontally and then vertically and that's how they're able to measure stars in declination and right ascension to such a high degree and this is probably about six foot two meters across in diameter uh, there would have been a little bit more cut this is a simplified drawing uh, the actual the, re the, the real one had a two two discs in a discs uh, but it also have two vertical ones as well because I could also work out where the north ecliptic pole was now while you can see the north pole star hardly moves and you can see where the pole is it is really really difficult to work out where the north ecliptic pole is but using this device you can see where the north ecliptic pole is and they worked out because of the precession of the ecliptic along the equator through the sky they also knew that the ecliptic pole was also moving around uh, uh, in a circle as well so this was an absolute critical piece of equipment now then once you've made a table of all the stars in the constellation what they then did is they made a globe now you can see in the back of this photo or picture there's a globe now i don't know to be honest what they made the globe out of but hipparchus says make a globe of an appropriate size whether it's whether it's small or large well again they've made this they've made this uh, to be in scale with the actual equipment that they're, that they're measuring and then what they did is they imprinted the globe whether it was in glass or whether it was in marble or granite or wood or bronze i really don't know just as an appropriate material so they marked the stars painted it in yellow and then scratched the constellations line and i think ptolemy decided to line the stars together rather than draw a pretty picture of a constellation because it would have been much more difficult so that's where we get a modern uh idea of constellations from with the line drawings how they're connected together you can make your own constellation if you read read ptolemy's paper uh, you can make your own constellations on a sheet of paper and connect the stars together and you will be reproducing something that's what nearly 2200 years old which is remarkable and this is a, a, a 
uh, not a true picture of him, but it's supposed to be a Renaissance picture uh, of Ptolemy. And he's got a, I think it's a glass globe with stars imprinted on it. And somebody has got the Earth, uh, which they did realise was round and they only inhabited a very, very small part of the Earth. And they knew that as well. Right, putting it together, this is something like what it would have looked like. So what we've got the mechanism in the middle, and then there's a front plate, sorry, a back plate, and then there's a front plate, and then this has to be suspended somehow. Well, they believe it was done inside of a box, so that we have the handle on the side with a little knob on so you can turn that round. So one turn would have been one day. So when you turn that round, there's a drive in the middle, as we saw earlier, with, the, with, all, with all, the, all the gear in. So it drives the moon round the fastest. Then we've got a pointer for the, where the sun is in the sky, which is basically the day of the year. And then we've got Venus and we've got Earth, we've got Mars, but not Earth, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. Now, they actually worked out that the, the Venus and Mercury move forwards and backwards in front of the sun, whereas the Mars, Jupiter and Saturn go around the periphery. So they got the actual stars, planets and moon uh, in order, the slower they were, the further they were, the further away. Now, Ptolemy says, a lot of people say Ptolemy say, says that the Earth was the centre of the solar system. If you read what, he, what is written, he actually says it doesn't matter whether the Earth is at the centre of the solar system system or the sun because for their experiments and their measurements it's irrelevant that the sun is at the center of the solar system because you can't measure the planets on earth from the sun they were just measuring the planets and the sun and the moon from the earth so that's why all the computations are geocentric and not solar centric and I suppose we've thought that the Greeks were a bit behind the times thinking that the Earth was, the solar system was geocentric, because it's obviously not to us. But several Greek astronomers actually pointed out that the Earth wasn't at the centre of the solar system, and it was the Sun. So they did actually know that. It isn't just a, a Galileo and Caparian uh, 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 idea. It was much earlier than that as well. So I think they can take the, the I'll, I'll give them the credit for that. Now then, here we have the uh, we, we have the, the solar system on the front, but we also have some writing on the front. And this basically tells you things about the seasons. So we've got spring, uh, summer, uh, uh, autumn and winter. And then on the back here, we see the graduations for the lunar cycle. And we also have some smaller disks. These disks pointed out to people when things like the Olympic Games was on in Olympia. There was also some other, other famous games in different parts of Greece. So when you might have had, I don't know, on a specific date, they could work out a specific date uh, in relation to the stars and the sun and the moon when they would have these games. So it was like a timepiece, it was a calendar. And this is what something like what they thought it looked like. So when I was at Rhodes uh, in Mahalda, I've nearly finished. I'll not keep you much longer. So as, as you drive down, the port at Rhodes uh, is right at the top of the island. And then we, we drove down the coast. And this is on the, on the east coast facing kind of Turkey and Cyprus. It's, it's like a large rocky outcrop. It's like a citadel. There's a village in the bottom, there's a fantastic bay, a lovely sandy bay in the bottom, and then at the back, the other side of the citadel, it's quite rocky, but there's another big bay, uh, and how, you could just imagine hundreds of ships being parked up on this beach, uh, delivering food, taking items away, doing transactions, and I'm sure the village must have been in the bottom here, where it is today, uh, fantastic place to visit, extremely hot. And then you walk through the through the streets, uh, no cars, it's just foot. And then you enter uh, the citadel on the north side, which is this next photo up here. 
queuing to get in. Now, this part of the build of the Citadel is more like 1300s, uh, 1200s, I believe, because there was a lot of, how can I put it, uh, action between the Greeks and the Turkish, and they had to, they had to up the defences. So they made, a, made, made, made it more of a castle. But before you climb up to this, this part, the, the early, at the bottom of the staircase, there's the Greek, the, these Greeks were extremely good artisans. And here is a car. Now, if I say this, they, they, they were responsible for creating some fantastic art in marble and bronze. A lot of it was nicked. I know from what I understand, there's actually a statue in the Vatican of Orpheus, uh, the serpent bearer, and it's believed to have been produced uh, in Lindos, where this is, uh, on Rhodes, uh, and was stolen by the Romans. And it's ended up in Rome, it's stayed there ever since. I suppose it's a bit like us nicking Elgin in marbles, I suppose. But anyway, because this was carved into the right rock face, nobody's managed to nick this. And you can see this is a typical uh, Greek ship of the early uh, Greek period. And there's it all, also, there's a mysterious figure here. And it looks like there's a man with a cape on here. It's like blowing. Uh, he's got his back, back to the bow. It's like kind of blowing. So you can see the side of the ship. And then there's like a, a structural piece that comes here. And then this is the bow. It's a bit like a Viking ship. So you've got like a nice big crest at the front. And it all comes down here. Now, if you look underneath, I can tell this is a, a trading ship or transportation ship rather than a... Uh, uh, a battleship because when you look at the base or oh, sorry at the bow of the ship it's got a really long smooth curve can you see that now that would be ideal to run up on a beach like that because the beach has got a really flat low profile so you don't want to get wet you don't want your goods to get wet so what you do is you you paddle you paddle your boat towards the ship towards the shore and run it up the beach and uh, that's a really good profile to run up a beach. And then what you do is you climb off and then jump off or get a ladder and jump off the front of the ship. You're on the beach and you're into town. So anyway, when you get up the stairs onto here, there's several la layers to this place. This is the temple. Uh, I can't remember which god it was. I think it was to the god Apollo. There's a temple at the top. It's been rebuilt. Uh, I think it was in the 40s and uh, they actually damaged some of it with concrete. They've actually used a different material now to, to glue some of it back together. It's in a fantastic place. It's right at the top, right at the top of the uh, mound. It's all rock. All, it's like a volcano, to be honest. And then there's a sheer drop off the side and it's absolutely, it, it commands a fantastic vantage point. Over here to the right, you're looking out over the Mediterranean Sea. So you've got an aspect where you're looking out over the rising sun. So you'd have seen the constellations come up, you'd have seen the sun and the moon come up in the morning. So I, I could imagine some priest up here or some astronomer, which would have been priest, they'd have had his astrolabe uh, and they'd have, been, they'd have been taking measurements. Uh, and this would have been vital for the priest uh, running the place because he needs to know when there's going to be a new moon, a full moon, an eclipse, or a lunar eclipse. So I really enjoy visiting that place. Twice I've been now. So this is this is looking south, and you can see it's a big drop down here. This is the back harbour. I think this might have been a military harbour. It's more protected. It's almost it almost looks as though somebody smashed this entrance through the rocks and built a basin to house ships in. But the other side of the uh, citadel, it's like a sandy beach uh, where it's, it's just a natural natural harbour. And this is a really big drop that, down there. And then as you approach the temple, there's like steps that come up to here. And then there's like a long facade. They put some of these columns back up. Uh, a little bit further down, I've not put these pictures in, there's some lovely column bases and they're made out of granite. And when you look at these column bases, uh, they're quite crisp. And somebody, I don't know, 
how they've done it, they've turned these column bases and they've got torus moulds and flutes and grooves and all kinds of stuff in. Absolutely brilliant. And these things survive. And I would have imagined that scholars would have worked here, whether they were, whether they were making bronze or whether they were making marble statues or, I don't know, writing poems or whatever. It was a place where scholars must have learned stuff. So these temples weren't just temples. They, they, were, like, they, they, they were cultural, like a university. I, I, I can't think of any way or other way to describe it. Uh, it was a place of knowledge, understanding, and probable worship as well. So these would have had a bronze foundry, here as well and like I said they were making things like Archimedes screws, they were making bronze statues, they'd have been making uh, urns and all kinds of stuff and of course I think this is the place where they would have built uh, the Antikythera or one of them I don't think there was one of these built I think there was many built and another thing is uh, it, we call it the Antikythera but personally, I think it would be better called an aura, uh, an, not an orary, an oracle. Because when you look at the word oracle, it means all knowing. Now, I think that in some of these Greek centres, like at Delphi, like at Rhodes, and perhaps at Athens, they would have all had their own because they all needed a calendar so they could communicate with each other. Because remember, these haven't got telephones. and I don't think they had passenger, <laughs> uh, passenger pigeons to take letters to people. So if you were going to meet up in Athens in four years' time, uh, you've got a map of the Aegean. You know where the islands are. You're good at sailing. It's, it's a case of, right, next month we're going to have to be in Athens, otherwise we're going to mix games. So I think that they would have made several of these and they'd have been dotted all over Greece. Uh, and one was on its way to Rome, it sank. Uh, and they're obviously timekeeping time pieces. And you just needed somebody like the local priest or the head, head of the uh, lo lo local uh, temple to keep it working. And of course, they had priestesses as well. Uh, so they'd have all had functions doing, doing this kind of stuff. So I think that brings me about to the end of my talk. And I hope... It's been about an hour. I hope it's not, not been too boring, but I found that talk exceptionally difficult to put together. Uh, and I've, I've been putting it together piece, piece, uh, piece by piece over, over about a year, but I've had to like shunt it together this, this week. Uh, and I've got a few artifacts that I could show you, but I'm going to have to switch cameras. So I don't know if you want to ask me some questions I right think now. Phil, thank you yeah? for talking on a fascinating yeah. subject uh yeah. could you stop i don't think i'm yeah sorry i don't <laughs> think i've done it justice to be honest paul but <laughs> it's been enjoyable thank you thank you uh, for that paul uh can you that's it and uh stop sharing your screen oh i'll stop sharing right okay okay and if go back to that and hopefully everybody can see everybody else now and uh as usual questions if you want to uh put your hand up that'll be lovely prefer a digital hand uh if you can do that so uh we're going to start off with tom wade tom can you unmute yourself please yeah phil fun, absolutely fantastic talk thank you just wanted to ask if the artifact had never been found were yeah. there any other records of it? No, no, there hasn't. There hasn't been any any uh, 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 records found of how to construct one. Uh, th th this is the thing about Egyptian and and Greek and, and Greek history. A lot of it has been destroyed, removed, lost, buried. <laughs> you see, like bronze, for instance. If you've got a country like Persia or Turkey that invades invades Greece which happened they would have bronze was an exceptionally a valuable commodity and they would have took it thought what the chuff's this melt it down make some spears make some swords they turned it into weapons and to weaponize themselves because it was a job to create bronze so if you find a, a ready source 
you can easily easy it's easy to melt it down and remake something else so i think a lot of stuff has not been lost, lost like being buried at the bottom of the sea or under the deserts of egypt or wherever a lot of stuff's been robbed and broken down and melted down and reused so if 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 this hadn't have sunk and somebody had found it. We, we, we wouldn't have known anything about it at all. And like, like I've said, so there's people... No, that, no records of one. No, no. However, we've got, we've got, a, we've got, I've got, I've got, I've opened it up here. A part of Ptolemy's book is <laughs> actually got a depiction, somebody's made a depiction of, of, of a uh, astrolabe and it describes in detail how to make it um, <laughs> and, and and how to divide it up into arcs and stuff. So why why they didn't do that? I don't know. I don't know. It's like, uh, would you write down how to build a ship, a battleship, or yeah. would it's a bit coming from a, a craftsmanship background? You, your master joiners and your master craftsmen would have passed the knowledge down to your pupils and you would have learned to do it rather than write it down right. because not everybody would have been able to read and write so perhaps some skills or some pieces of equipment and technology were given it would be passed on the problem with that is when you die or get old or you you, you don't have a new apprentice that skill and knowledge goes with them and you never get it back is it a working model of this then well, some people have made one. <laughs> yes, there's a few. In fact, I found you can buy, you can actually buy one for several hundred pounds if you want one. <laughs> uh, but I've, I've, I've had, a, I've, I'll show you a picture. I've, 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 I've had a go because, because I was interested. I want, I, I didn't know how big these things were, but anyway, I've, I've had a go at making one myself. It's not finished yet, but I, I'm, it's a work in progress. <laughs> I'll show you later before we finish. Tom, yeah, and it's, and it's same with. Yeah, I was going to say, Tom. I believe that there are some uh, 3D printer plans kicking around the internet. If, oh, you've, right. got, if you've got an access, if you've got access to uh, a 3D printer, uh, you might be able to uh, find some uh, plans for it and uh, get one printed out. Yeah, interesting. We've probably got a computer as old as that in our garage. <laughs> <laughs> I've got an Atari ST, is it ST? No. 64 in loft. <laughs> <laughs> with, a, with, a dot print, with a dot printer. <laughs> it's uh, the, the, the idea that um, um, information from that uh, period of time. Uh, has been lost. Uh, it, it also gets consumed, as Phil said, uh, artifacts get reused, uh, they get melted down etc and broken up. Uh, but the great problem with the ancient world is that the great depositories uh, like the, uh, the library at Alexand uh, Alexander, uh, Alexandria uh, basically burnt down and a whole load of but, you know, a lot of information from that era was lost. Uh, there is also some evidence that um, at the, uh, the fall of the Roman Empire, artifacts like uh, the Antikythera mechanism might have ended up in, um, in, in the, uh, the Near East, in Arab hands. And yes. And they broke it down and they used elements. So you find elements of gearing and things like that in Arab astrolabes. And there's yeah. no, there's no um, uh, sort of vector for the design to have come through their culture. Mm. So they've, they've obviously uh, gained it from somewhere else. Mm. So, um, so, you know, there is evidence that that information was absorbed into other cultures. Mm, that's true. But, well, we, we get the Almagest today uh, via via the via the Far East. If if they hadn't have got a copy of the Almagest uh, that was burnt in in uh, Alexandria, we wouldn't have it wouldn't have come back to the 
to the West if it hadn't been for them copying it. Yeah. So yeah, it, 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 it's yeah, you're quite right, and they, they probably had the same technology, and but but they used it slightly different because they were interested in taking different measurements. They were they were just a, the sun and the moon, and they weren't interested in in doing the same as what Ptolemy did. Okay, so I'm looking around. Uh, Phil, you've worked really hard today. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you want to show us your objects, or do you want do to you leave please, that for another? Well, well, well no. I'll, can, can we manage five, ten minutes? We can. So, can you? Uh, do, do you want to? Yeah. yeah. Can uh, well, if I spotlight your video then, and can, if I can you? If I can swap it. Ah, there we go. Is that is that all right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, you can. See, right. Okay. So so. So I've got a couple of things here. So you can see from this roughly how big it is compared to my hands. It's not exactly the same size, but it, it's pretty close. So what I've got here, I, don't, I suppose you can see, I've got a planisphere here. So around the side, this is how it works. You've got your August, your July, June. So we've got, and then we've got the dates. So you've got a calendar around, uh, around your planisphere. That's all normal stuff that we understand. Right, and right in the center, we've got a spindle, okay. And then we've got the, it's basically a hub in the center. And then you've got your spindles that go through the center and then connected to them, we've got the spikes. So these spikes, when you turn the handle, when you turn the handle on the side, the, these will rotate. So uh, at the moment, where are we? So we'd have the sun, we'd have the sun on this one, and this is on the 5th of, uh, where are we? Oh, I've moved, I've got it. So we'd have, we'd have it, that on the 5th of November, and then all the planets, so we've got Mars over here, we've got the moon down here, we've got the, I don't know, uh, what's we've got here? I've got uh, Venus. So basically, as you turn the handle, this will move around in increments each day. So what you'll be able to tell is where the planets are. But more crucially, you'll also know where the moon is in the sky because that will move around at a different speed to everything else. So that's the front. And this would have been in bronze and then there'd been an inscription on the front about the seasons and how things work. Now, how you measure this or get, get the information into the machine is, thanks to Trevor, I've spent a lot of time using this, uh, and this is basically, it's, it's, it's a miniature astrolabe. So we've got a calendar around, the, around here, which we've got November, October, September. At the front, we've got March on the 21st. And this is a really good instrument for working out what day it is of the month, because that's inclined on the side. There's an inclination. So you incline this to your latitude. So when you have that level on the floor, this is inclined and it points out towards the celestial equator. And then when the sun is on the equator and that's at zero degrees and that's pointing to the pole, the sun shines through the tube, because that's a tube, uh, and the sun will like shine onto your hand or a piece of paper. So on the, on the solstice or the equinoxes, if you set it up, you can work out what day of the, of, the, of the year it is. The other thing is you can point this and basically plot plot the stars and the sun across the sky. Now then, I did this. I don't know if you can see this very well. So basically, I, I showed you this one of these drawings. Hang on, right way up. So we've got the equator coming across here. We've got the first point of Aries, which is just here. So the sun's ascending and then it comes up to the solstice and then it starts going back down. So what I did is I tried to track the sun and plot it across the graph paper. What I worked out is down here, the sun's actually traveling faster. The sun travels at, is it, at a degree a day. And then when it gets up here, where it's near the solstice in the summer, it's actually traveling a lot less than 0.97 degrees. If you work out 365 uh, 
uh, 365 and a quarter divided by 360. The sun moves about 0.79 degrees a day. Well, down here, it definitely moves more than that. And up here, it definitely moves less. And that's because the Earth moves closer and further away from the sun during the year. So you can plot it. Now then, so you can not only plot its inclination, you can also plot its speed. And then this is basically what Ptolemy did. If you get a grid, so we've got 0, 30, 90. You can plot the sun on, on a piece of paper, but then you can also plot the planets on the paper. Oh, actually, what am I doing? It's that way. So we've got uh, we've got Leo here. We've got Virgo, Libra, Phil, Scorpio. Phil, can yeah. you hold it a little bit closer to the... Uh... Oh, 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 can you, oh, is that better? Uh, hold it still. Hold it still. Yeah. Okay, so what that's I've, lovely. So what, so what I've done on here, I've plotted the sun and the constellations basically on a map. And if you read Ptolemy's work, the tables he's got, you can plot your own constellations back onto a piece of paper. And that's what he did. He simplified how you draw the, draw the sky. But obviously, it's on a rectangular piece of paper. So we're taking, using, using this, you can take spherical observations in the sky up and down, so you've got your declination, you've got your right, right, right ascension, plot it on a table and then you can plot it onto a sheet of paper. And then once you've done that, you can plot the sun and moon onto it as well and where it could intersect the nodes. And that, that's basically what they did. So, and then on the back side, this is really tricky, I failed on this. Now then, this is the back side of the antic. Hang on, show me paper version first. Once again, Phil, this can is hold back it a little the closer. Theory, and you can see, oh, oh, I'm going to do it that way. Can you see that? Hold it still. Does that yep. look good? So we've got two two circles that get larger from the, from, <laughs> from the inside to the outside. Now, that would have been a brass plate with a groove running in it so that the arms, as they turn round each month, a, a notch each month, the hand mechanism moves along the slot and moves out so you can see in metonic and what was it the calypic periods and then you've got to divide it up into into your months now i've tried to do that i did that on a piece of hardboard so i did that on a piece of hardboard and then i started cutting out the slot so that the hand mechanism with a wait a minute with a pin on it can you see the pin so the pin runs in the groove can you see how that works from the center the problem is when you start cutting this out i've only done one spiral you can you see how the spiral falls out now obviously in bronze it's stronger uh i'm i'm, I'm going to try it in a piece of i don't know four millimeter ply but hardboard isn't strong enough <laughs> it's not strong enough to hold it i'm basically making a giant slinky uh, so perhaps you could credit the greeks for making the first slinky as well so i don't know if they had some plates at the back to kind of hold that in place so it don't, doesn't move about so you've got to sort of drawn this out scratched it out and then there'd been a pin in the center for that to move round on and as it goes round it slides out of the mechanism because it's getting longer as it goes round. Ingenious. But anyway, I've, I've come unstuck at that point. <laughs> so I don't, I'm going to try it with a different material uh, to see if I can uh, see if I can make it any better. So, <laughs> so anyway, I'm trying to make my arms and my face a bit better. I'm, it, it's a project I'm just trying to get. Because I want to use it, you know, when we do out, out of school talks and places, I want to use it as part of a a demonstration piece but it is it's not until you try and make something that you realize really well how on earth did they do this it makes you it gives you a whole level of appreciation instead of just reading about it so you can see what i've been doing <laughs> phil thank you for a fascinating talk and you're welcome uh, uh we'll uh a stepping off point to uh, to do some further reading and research. So, so yeah. thank you for that. Uh, You're ladies, 
ladies and gentlemen, can we give Phil a big Beck Sprint Swinton uh, Astronomical Society? Thank you. Thanks, Phil. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs>